Your Bibles are there, open to Genesis chapter 13. If you need the notes for this morning, just hold your hand up. Not giving up on Isaiah, the Lord just laid on my heart to reverse the services. Tonight, Lord willing, I'll be preaching from Isaiah 44. So we'll be looking, picking up Isaiah tonight, but God just had me reverse the services, the messages for the day. So I need to be back tonight for Isaiah as well. This morning I'm preaching on whatever happened to Brother Lot. Whatever happened to Brother Lot? That's a sad question that I'm afraid too often we ask. If we just paused right here and looked around our little group, we might ask, I wonder what happened to Brother so-and-so. What happened to Sister so-and-so? Maybe not just because they're just... Uh, changed a little bit, but you can look at their life and you say, boy, when you look at somebody's life in 20, 30 years, you say, what happened? What happened? It's such a change, such a difference, such a disastrous end. I hope you know the story. That's one of the difficulties of today's society is people don't know the Bible because uh, we're looking at the overall picture of Lot. But here we have the story of Lot and Abram. You'll pardon me if I interchange Abram with Abraham because God changes his name down the road a little bit to Abraham. And so Abraham and his nephew Lot both rich fellows, having some strife between the herdsmen and from themselves. In fact, Abraham said, he says, let there be no strife between you and I and our herdsmen. So there was some strife between the two because of, uh, we're well, not privy to everything, but because of the land, because of the possessions. And we see there that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, a very wicked, wicked city, very wicked, wicked area. And so Lot, Abraham goes one way, Lot goes another The next two steps of, eight of Lot's life are not pleasant. We find over in just the next chapter, we find the enemy dwelt, uh, actually Lot is actually living down in Sodom, and he's being captured by the enemy. But in chapter 19, which we'll be looking at this morning, uh, we find Lot in the city gates, Lot in a position of authority, Lot living in town, living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and not just living there with protest, but living there as one of the integral people, one of the main people in the town there at the gate where the justice would sometimes be, where people would, the businessmen would sit. And so he was there. And in chapter 19, verse number 1, if you want to turn over there very quickly, 19, verse number 1, And there came two angels to Sodom and even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, Lot seeing them, rose up to meet them, and bowed himself with his face to the ground. So there he is in the evening, and in comes two angels. The angels are there to remove Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah, because God is about to destroy the city because of their wickedness, because of their sin. By the way, just because God hasn't destroyed yet, doesn't mean God's not fed up with sin. All right, so he's destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Because of sin. So, but the angels are there to pull Lot and his family out. And so Lot sees them coming, recognizes them as spiritual beings, and he asks them to come, and he tries to get them to come into his house. And the angel says, no, we'll just camp out here in the streets tonight. We don't want to go in your house. I wonder what was in Lot's house that they thought they didn't want to see and what they didn't want to be a part of. But they said, no, we'll just stay out here. But Lot convinced them, no, come on in and spend the night. Because Lot was afraid of what would happen to him. If you know the rest of the story, that night while the angels were there in Lot's house, the men of the city came and wanted to have incestual, wicked, vile relationships, physical relationships, homosexual relationships with the angels that came into Lot's house. You say, preacher, that sounds wicked. It is wicked. It is vile. It is sad. But that's what happened. And so they said, we want to have relations with them. Lot came out and says, no, don't do that. He says, don't do that wicked thing. And then an amazing thing that Lot says, here's my two virgin daughters, Take them instead and do what you want, but leave the angels alone. Whatever happened to Lot? What happened to Brother Lot? Well, the men said, we don't want them, we want the men inside. And so they were said, well, we're going to go ahead and attack you. And the angels reached out and grabbed Lot, pulled him back in the house and closed the door. And blinded the men there at the door, and it says they just wore themselves out trying to get in all night. Well, the angel said the next morning, said, you better get out. We're going to destroy the city. Get out. Get your family. Get anybody else. So he went to his daughters and sons-in-laws, and he says, get out. God is going to destroy the city. Get out. They laughed. They mocked him. You talking about God? You talking about spiritual things? So he went, and they would not leave. So God's, the angels grabbed Lot and his family. Actually, had to grab him. They just tarried, still hanging around in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they grabbed him and pulled him out of the city. With the command, no, don't look back. 
We know the story. Lot's wife looked back. She looked back and became a pillar of salt. They destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and then Lot and his two daughters, then living, went to, Zo went to a small city, but then left from there and went to a cave. So at the end of chapter 19, we find him living in a cave with his daughters. We also know the story, how the daughters, because they thought all their men were gone, they weren't going to know anybody, they got their father drunk, they got Lot drunk two nights in a row, and had incestual relationships with him to produce children. What a, what a wicked mess. I don't even like talking about it, but God here puts it to help us understand what a wicked mess that they're in. So the question comes, what happened to Brother Lot? What happened to Brother Lot? So this morning we're looking at that. He went from wealth... With Sodom, with, with, with Abraham, remember they, could, they had this beef because they had all the, all the cattle and all the wealth, had lots of wealth, all those things, to absolute abject poverty, living in a cave with nothing. He went from fame and influence, sitting in the city gates, knowing, wandering around with Abraham that people knew about because they were very wealthy, that after chapter 19 you never hear of him again. Gone from the Scriptures except when God refers back to him as an object lesson. He went from living, listen, he went from living in a family, in a home that was close to God, that was being used of God, was going to bless the whole world. He and Abraham, because Abraham, we know God says, I'm going to use you and bless you and all the nations will be blessed from you. And he was living with Abraham, the friend of God, and he was there and he was going to be part of that. What an amazing thing. He went from that to living in a cave after incestual relationships with his daughter and his grandchildren then became two enemies. Their descendants became enemies of anything spiritual, enemies of God, hatred of God. How in the, what happened? To brother Lot. Yeah. Lot was not, from what I can tell, a bad man. Wasn't a bank robber. He didn't kill people. He was not a bad man. He was not an evil man. The Bible tells us he was a Christian man. He was just, righteous, in God's standing because of his faith in God. So he wasn't a bad man, he wasn't a vile man, he just made some wrong choices and chose wrong spiritual lifestyle. Just some wrong choices. And he just went down those choices, and we study this so often because it, his tendency, he's just a man, is just like ours. In other words, in six months to a year, our story, people can be looking around and saying, have you heard about brother so-and-so? Have you heard about sister so-and-so? Have you heard about that family? What happened to them? I don't want that to be, I don't want them to say, did you hear about Pastor Bryson? What happened to him? I don't want it said about you. I don't want it to say, I, let's don't go down that road. So this morning as we look at this, we have to look at the two fellows, Abraham, who was not perfect either. But his general leaning was to follow God. His general leaning was to do right. He was called the friend of God. So we got Abraham and Lot, whose life ended up devastated. So the question is, whose do we want to model after? Who would we like to end up like, Abraham or Lot? So this morning we're going to go ahead and let's take a look and we're going to see where we are, where we might be, learn and guard ourselves and make changes to our lives so we don't have to end like Lot. So people won't be saying, what, whatever happened to brother or sister, and you can put your name in there. Are you with me this morning? So it, it, looks tell, it looks tough, it looks bad, because it is a wicked city, a wicked time, but these God's got it in there. God didn't have to tell us about Lot, but He put, us in, put it in there, not so we can condemn Lot, not so we can feel spiritual, so, but we can be on guard that we don't follow His path. He's the example. So let's learn about it. And if you find yourself anywhere on this trek, anywhere in this position, of life's, Lot's life, let's stop and say, God, help me, and make the change to get out of that. Lot could have stopped many places. But this morning, very simply this morning, we're going to see what happened to Lot. It can happen to us. So let's be on guard. Let God speak to our hearts, and let God help us be what we need to be. Number one, we find what happened to Brother Lot. He had coattail spirituality. He had coattail spirituality. We normally hear about the expression on somebody's coattails in politics. You know, if the president wins by a big margin, then everybody says, well, they just got in on his coattails. They just got in because of their association with somebody else. Back in the, not that many years ago, many people got their jobs and the utilities and whatnot because they had somebody 
they knew our family inside. They got the job by coattail. They went in by that. So the idea is somebody's coattail, they wear longer coats than a few years ago. They grab a hold and you're just riding their coattail in. So we see here, I believe what we have with Lot's issue, a saved man, a Christian man, if you will, in the Old Testament sense, but he had coattail spirituality. In other words, he lacked devotion to God. He lacked devotion to God. We find Abraham always making altars. Everywhere Abraham went, he built an altar. Everywhere Abraham went, he called upon God. He was a friend of God. And Lot was living with him, Lot and his family. But we never find Lot building an altar. We never find Lot talking to God. We never find Lot doing anything spiritual. But he was no doubt spiritual because he was a just man. He was a saved man, if you will. He was living with Abraham, so he had that. He recognized the angels coming to Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew about God, but we find he didn't apparently have his own spiritual walk. He did not have a walk of his own. He did not build an altar. He did not pray. He did not do anything we can see spiritually. So he was just hanging on spiritually to Abram's coattails. He was just going along in his spiritual life because Abraham was leading him. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot survive if we're riding somebody else's spiritual coattails. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? I don't care if you've been a member of this church for 150 years, you cannot ride on the church's coattails. You cannot ride on the pastor's coattails. You can't ride on your mom and dad's spiritual coattails. You can't ride on your sp spouse's spiritual coattails and expect to survive. He was just holding on, apparently, Abraham. No doubt, Abraham said, all right, it's time for church, if you would. They get to the altar, and they'd have their sacrifices. No doubt, Lot was there, and they'd pray, and no doubt, Lot was there. He might say, Lot, it's your turn to say the blessing. He might have said the blessing, but he himself had no walk with God. The idea that we can hold on to somebody else's spiritual coattails, it'd be just like, say, boy, I am starving to death. I've been on a diet for 10 minutes, and I am starving to death. Anybody know what that's like? As soon as you decide you're going on a diet, man, you are hungry. You say, man, I've been having eaten for 15 minutes. I am starving to death. Would you please eat a sandwich for me? And they eat the sandwich, you say, boy, I feel better. You say that for you. Oh, you're out there and you've been working and boy, just sweating. You're just so thirsty, so thirsty. Man, I'm about to die of thirst. Do you have a Coke? Yeah, would you drink it for me? Whew. Boy, I feel better. <laughs> or you say, hey, Doc says my gallbladder's bad. Would you go get have your gallbladder out for me? <laughs> and they take out that other person's gallbladder. You say, boy, I'm fine now. You say, that's ridiculous. So it is for you and I to think we can live on somebody else's spirituality. So it is that you and I can think we can go ahead and maintain that we don't have to be in the book. We don't have to make convictional stands. We don't have to believe God. We don't have to act right. We just have to go ahead and go along. Lot's problem started. Coattail spirituality. I think, we, I think from his life we can discern something that he had no personal conviction and separation. He had no personal convictions and separation. Conviction, as we know, it means the things that you believe you're willing to die for, things you say, this is absolutely true in my heart, this is an absolute decision I've made, and then separation is you separate from the ungodly and you separate from sin. I find here, I, from looking at his life, I see no personal conviction and separation. Yeah. Stay with me this morning. I want to help you with something. You've got to have both to survive. Conviction and separation. You have to be convicted about the things of the Bible, that yes, it's so, yes, it's true, this is right, this is wrong. You have to say, if God says this is wrong, I believe it's also wrong, and I'm going to base my life upon it. Whether it be here in California, whether it be with the homosexuality, whether it be with, uh, about uh, relationships with other people outside of marriage, with, you just put it down. If you say, if God says it, I have convictions about that. That's convictions where you say, I'm establishing my life, and I believe it, and I'm going to follow it. And then separation means you go ahead and start living it. You have to have both the conviction and separation if we're going to survive. Very quickly, separation without conviction. In other words, I separate from evil, but I don't believe it. I separate from sin, but I don't think it's that bad. I separate, and I, and I do this, and I don't do that, even though I don't think it's that bad. Why? Because I'm riding on somebody else's coattails. Because that's what the pastor says. Because that's what my family says. I have no convictions, but I've got the separation. What that brings is, what that is, that's hypocrisy. I mean, in other words, you're pretending to be spiritual. You're pretending to be something that you're not. So we find separation without conviction, it brings hypocrisy. And by the way, it's hard. It's a miserable, listen, 
It's a miserable life to try to live separated without the convictions. It's a miserable life to say, I'm not going to do that, but I sure wish I could. It's a miserable life, it's a hard life to say, I'm, all right, I'm, I'm going to do this, but I don't want to do this. It's so hard, it, it brings no joy, no peace, it only brings anger, and it's doomed for failure. That's separation without conviction. Okay, I'm doing that because that's what the preacher says. I'm doing it because it's what's expected, but you don't believe it. Whew. That's a hard life. That's a miserable life. That's what happens when young folks grow up in a church that do not have their own spiritual walk or people that get saved and for a while, but they don't have their own convictions. They don't have their riding on the coattails of somebody else. And they're, so they're trying to live that life. It's miserable. And as soon as they're out, as soon as they're away, they're like Lot. They just find themselves in sin. So separation without conviction is hypocrisy. But what if you have convictions without separation? In other words, I believe it, but I'm not going to act upon it. I believe it, but I'm not going to let it change me. I believe it, but I'm not going to live that way. Guess what? That's also hypocrisy. You're playing to the world. You say, I believe it, but I'm not going to let other folks know it. I believe it, but I'm not going to let it change me. I believe it, but I'm not going to change my lifestyle. Listen, that's just riding also on, on somebody's coattails. It's easy to live that way as a compromiser, and it's also doomed for failure. So we find Lot's first issue was coattail spirituality. You're sitting here today and say, well, I'm all right because my family's all right. No, you've got to have a walk with God. I must have a walk for God. Well, I'm all right because I'm in a, in a strong Bible-preaching church. No, you've got to have a walk with God yourself. Uh, hello? We have to have those same convictions. We have to have those same decisions. We have to be, you can't ride along in somebody else's coattails. So right now, if you say, well, I've been all right, but I've not been in, my, in the Bible. I've not been in prayer. I've not, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm separated. I don't do this but only because the preacher says I shouldn't. I don't do this only because my spouse would think I wasn't. No, we've got to get down to the place where we're not riding on somebody's spiritual coattails, but know God ourselves. Lot wasn't a bad guy. He was just riding on somebody else's coattails spiritually. How's your spiritual life? In other words, if there was nobody else around, how would your Christian life be? How would your walk with God be? How would your separation be? Coattail spirituality. Number two, we find a catastrophic separation. A catastrophic separation. I almost called it a convenient separation. Now, the separation I was talking about a minute ago was from sin, from wickedness. This is a separation from good, a separation from something that's good. He left the friend of God. He left the friend of God. It was catastrophic for him. When he left, especially since he was holding on to Abram's coattails, especially since that was his spiritual anchor, when he left, he got himself in trouble. He got himself in That's why for young folks and anybody, well, when you leave home, you better make sure you've got your own spiritual walk. You've got your own convictions. You've got your own stand, your own position, your own walk with God. Because once you're separated, you're headed for trouble if you do not have that strength. Lot had no spiritual strength. Lot was spiritually weak. And so when he separated from Abraham, it wasn't long before he found himself in trouble. As we just read there at the first part in Genesis 13, there was strife between Abraham and Lot, between his herdsmen and their herdsmen. And so Abraham finally says, all right, we can't keep fighting like this. He said, our enemy is out there watching. He said, we're being a bad testimony. He says, you pick a direction. Whatever direction you go, I'll go the other. Lot seemed pretty quick to want to leave. Well, I've seen it too often. People begin to drift away from God, start missing church a little bit, get under conviction, and all of a sudden, listen carefully, an opportunity arrives. Preacher, I know I haven't been to church much. I know I haven't given any money. I know I haven't tithed. I know I've been doing this. But, you know, I hope you'll be praying for me. By the way, I got a big offer in the state next door. Isn't that convenient? Or my mom and dad are sick. I think we're going to move over to here and take it. I'm not saying you shouldn't take care of your mom and dad. But it's amazing that sometimes there's convenient separations that come. How convenient. Teenagers sometimes find a convenient jobs to keep them out of the house of God and away from God. A 
new house. New, I'm just saying how convenient. Lot got himself in trouble. It was a catastrophic separation. It was also very convenient for him to do that, but it was catastrophic for him. Sometimes, like in the case here, people problems cause separation. Here, Lot and Abraham were having trouble. Yeah. I know you'll find this hard to believe, but I wasn't there. Okay. So I'm not sure all that went on. But I would like to hope and think they could have worked it out. I guarantee you, at the end of Genesis 19, when Lot has already had those immoral relationships with his daughters, and he's lost his wife, and he lost the other two daughters, Lot probably went back and thought, I should have worked it out with Abraham. I should have told my herdsman to shut up. I should have go ahead and say, Abraham, what do you want us to do? Let us work this out. But I've seen people get away from the right place, go to the wrong place, and a catastrophic separation from a church or from a family because of people problems. When you look at Lot's life, there was a bigger issue at the end than he and Abraham arguing about who got the most water for their cows. Are you listening to me? Boy, you be real careful about pulling yourself and your family out of church, away from God because of people problems. There's bigger issues. A lot, no doubt, would have said, I, I wish I'd made it up with Abraham. I wish, I, I wish I'd been right with Abraham. Let me help you something with people problems. Get over it. Get over it. Grow up. Get going. Hello. Yeah, I'm not talking about there if, if it's in danger of life or being abused. I'm just talking about you get miffed at somebody or somebody's not nice to you. It's an amazing thing. Your child comes home from kindergarten and some kid's not nice to him, and you try to teen Well, this is how you get along with them. Or you just avoid them. Or you just understand that hurting people hurt and they must be hurting on the inside. You go do good things to them and you teach your kid. Now, you go off and do that. And then you get to church and somebody crosses their eyes at you or says something unkind about you and you say, we're out of here. Abraham said, we can't keep arguing like this. Lot didn't say, I don't want to leave. I'm not strong enough. What, what do we need to do to make this right? Causes of why it happened, no doubt pride. Probably his priority was out of whack. His priority was land wasn't big enough to support them both. He didn't say, well, I'm going to send some of my herdsmen over the far hill, but I want to stay here with you, Abraham. I'll send them over there, and I'll go check on them. I'll commute. Well, that's why I have to be careful about our changes and our separation. I preached on it just the other night. By the way, we have three group counsel counseling sessions a week here. Free. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. We have groups for accountability. You better be in church. How's that for accountability? All right. You be here tonight, Wednesday night. But as I was preaching the other night, we have to make sure that our separation, the changes we make, are directed by God and not devised by our hearts. I think that was just Wednesday night when I, boy, a lot of water goes under the bridge, and I forget what, when I preached it. But in Proverbs 16, 9, it says, a man's heart devises his way. We figure out our way. We plot our way. We connive our way. We manipulate our way. It says, but the Lord directeth his steps. We need to make sure our changes are God-directed and not devised in our heart. Abraham said, well, Lot, we can't go on like this. He said, you pick away in one way, and I'll go the other. Lot says, hmm, look over there. He said, that looks like the best land. That's great land. That's a good place. That's where I'm going to make the most money. And so he chose that direction. He devised his way. He figured out his way instead of letting God direct his steps. So you better make sure you let God direct your steps. A catastrophic separation. I'm just saying... Well, be very careful when you separate from a church, you separate from a school, when you separate from a family, you separate from God's people. Be careful about that because it was catastrophic to Lot. If he did, could have just stayed with Abraham. It was like the prodigal son. He went into a far country. Be careful when you separate from good people, right people. Take, and if you do have to separate, take steps to protect yourself. 
make commitments no matter what. Catastrophic separation. Number three, we find, number three, he had coattail spirituality. Boy, if you get nothing else, man, just make sure you're strong. He had a catastrophic separation, separating from the good. Boy, it breaks my heart when I see folks that somehow get a burr under their saddle or something comes and, man, they separate from church. Not because it's me, but just hate to see them get away from a good family and a good church and good teaching. And they just fall away. Catastrophic separation. Number three, he was carnal sighted. He was carnal sighted. You've heard of near sighted? This was carnal sighted. In other words, he only saw carnal things. He was looking at carnal things. That's why the Bible says he pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So when he separated, he chose the good land and he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Yeah, if you've been much tent camping, and we're not talking about the little kind little pup tents you crawl under. It was a big tent. They lived there. And so they would sit there and have their dinner. They'd sit there and have their Sumatra coffee in the morning. Looking out the tent window or the tent door, looking over Sodom. Get up in the morning and stretch and look over Sodom. He pitched his tent, his thought, his directions toward Sodom. And he knew what Sodom was about. God says here, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. He would know what that was, just like we know what cities are known for. You say Las Vegas. Whether you've been to Las Vegas or not, you know what Las Vegas is generally about. We talk about San Francisco. You know, some 25 years ago, 26 years ago, when we first came out here and started the church, went back to Texas, where I've been pastoring before, into a different preacher's meeting, was there at some conference, and sitting there at a restaurant doing the Baptist thing, you know, Baptist preacher thing, drinking coffee and eating. And introducing ourselves, and they says, where are you from? And I says, California. And they said, where? I said, just outside San Francisco. I could see them suddenly move a little farther away from me, all right? We know. We know what goes on in different cities. We know that. They no doubt knew that also. They didn't have the television went up, but they knew it was exceedingly wicked. And so he pitched his tent towards Sodom. In other words, he just get up and just kind of look that way. Might call it an alluring distraction. Looking to see what he saw. Wasn't doing anything wrong yet. Wasn't moving yet, but boy, his eyes were, he was just watching. I have to ask us, what's your alluring distractions today? What television program, what internet sites, what group, what's the allure? Well, I'm just looking. It's out, that's carnal sightedness. He's just looking at the carnal. He looked at that. Just looking, just studying. Well, that's why I have to be careful. The Bible says, my eye affecteth my heart. Where are you pitching your tent toward, Dad? He pitched it toward Sodom. Where are you pitching your heart toward? Where are you pitching your family toward? Let me help you with something. I love how God had them set up the tents as they were traveling through the wilderness. Remember they had the tabernacle in the middle? The tabernacle, and they could see the Shekinah glory come. They cloud boom down, and that's where God met with them. They had the tabernacle, and they took all the tribes surrounding the tabernacle, all pointed toward the tabernacle. They pitched their tent toward the tabernacle. They pitched their tent toward church. They pitched their tent toward the presence of God. They pitched their tent toward spiritual things, because no matter what else they might do the rest of the day, when they came home at night, when they got there, it was pitched toward that. You and I need to pitch our tent toward God. We need to pitch our tent toward the church. Hello? The church, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. God's body, God's bride, who we are. I'm not talking about just the building. I'm talking about us that we pitch our tent toward the things of God. And so we find he was carnal sighted. In other words, he looked away from God. He looked away from God. It was wicked. I think I'll look at it anyway. It was vile. I think I'll put my eyes on it anyway. It was wicked. I think I'll just tune in just a little bit anyway. What happened to Brother Lot? (laughs) 
He wasn't very spiritual. Then he had some people problems, and he moved out. And then he started looking away from God. Very quickly, he then moved into complete submergence. Complete submergence. That's why in Genesis 19, actually before then, in previous chapters, when the enemy came and stole all the people out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abram went back and, de and delivered them, he was living in Sodom, he was dwelling in Sodom. But here in chapter 19, verse number 1, there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate. He was living in the city. In other words, he's lived in a city without God. He moved into a city without God. That's where he existed. That's where he lived. He apparently, he didn't have an altar. He didn't have any Christian friends. He didn't have, well, as far as we know, he went and never visited with Abram. He was, just, he was just immersed in it. He was saturated in that society. He lived in a city without God. What happened to Brother Lot? Notice, I saw something this week when I was studying that. His original problem that got him out of church, if you will, his original problem that made him separate from Abraham is not an issue at all. He doesn't have any cattle. He doesn't have any herdsmen, as far as we can tell. When he left the city, he wasn't worried about that. What made him separate from Abram is not an issue. Did he go back? No. It's an amazing thing. People find reasons. That's why it's a convenient separation. It's all those things bring out, out of the way. I find people sometimes, they say, well, it's, maybe it's money, or maybe it's time, or maybe it's health, or maybe it's this. And when the problem's gone, they're still gone. Be careful. It was that complete saturation. His distraction, listen carefully, became his destination. His distraction became his destination. Well, I'll just watch this immorality a little bit. Careful. Distraction can become your destination. Well, I'll just kind of watch the alcohol and wine crowd. I'll just study a little bit about wine. Watch out. The distraction becomes a destination. Well, I'll just do a little flirting with the secretary or with the boss. Distraction becomes destination. He's now in the city. That's why I preached the other night. I hate to go back. I just preach it again because you miss it. We become what we follow. Second Kings seventeen five says they followed vanity and became vain. We become what we follow. We become what we look at. We become what we follow. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Very quickly. He went from that to callous sensitivity. Calloused sensitivity. I hope you're still awake with me this morning. I'm just saying we just look at this and it breaks my heart as I can see how easy it is for so many people, easy it is for all of us to go down that path. We have to wake up. Whatever happened to Brother Lot? What, he, was, he was with Abraham. He was a saved man. He was a right man living with the friend of God. Whoa, what a great man. What a great family. What a great relationship. And we turn around and we find him devastated and destroyed and ruined and an object lesson of what we're not supposed to be like. What happened? He just simply got away from God and moved into this wicked city and left himself. He would have to find his callous sensitivity. In other words, he lived like a man that knew not God. He lived like a man that knew not God. He was dwelling there in the gates, but I don't think he was handing out any gospel tracts. He was living there in the gates, but I don't think he was trying to get a Bible study together to start a church anywhere. I don't think he was trying to sing some hymns. He was living there in the city and part of the city, living like a man who knew not God. 2 Peter 2.8 says, and I think that's in your notes, For that righteous man, talking about Lot, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. In other words, watching their homosexuality, watching their immorality, it vexed his soul. Day by day, listening and watching them just vexed his soul. i got news for you. Christians today are having their souls vexed because we're hearing and seeing every single day that homosexuality is all right, bestiality is all right. Uh, uh, don't tell your child that they're a boy or a girl. Our souls are getting vexed. 
That's why you need to make sure that you and I spend as much time in the Word of God and in the house of God as we can. Hello? But if we don't want to end up the same way Lot did. That's why your kids need to be immersed as much spiritual things as you can. Whether in the Christian school or in the public school, you need to do everything you can to immerse them in the right things and hearing the right things because it's out there trying to vex their soul. The word vex there has an aspect, if you take the time later on look it up in the Hebrew, it means to be tortured, and it comes from a root word that means to go to the bottom. His righteous soul was vexed, tortured, taken to the bottom. I mean, he was starting at some spiritual level, although he wasn't very spiritual when he left Abraham. The boy took his soul right to the bottom. Right to the bottom. Hearing and seeing their wicked deeds took him to the bottom. Say, preacher, why do you always preach to us about being careful where we go and what we do and what we watch? Because I don't want your soul and I don't want my soul vexed, taken to the bottom. It can happen to anybody. Oh, no, preacher, we're sitting in church today. He was sitting in church with Abraham, too, going to the altars. But he was messed up. But how do you know his sensitivity was calloused? In other words, he watched it. it was, his soul went to the bottom pretty soon. It didn't bother. It must not have bothered him at all. Why? It says, when they, when they came to have incestual relationships with those angels, he called them brethren. He says, don't do that, brethren. I've got news for you. Somebody wanted to come rape my daughters, I wouldn't call them brother. But they're one of those anymore. He says, don't do that, brethren. And then he offered his two daughters. Then he got drunk twice. Two nights in a row, they got him drunk so they could have incestual relationships with him. How could it be? It just didn't seem so terrible to him anymore. Our sensitivities are being calloused. I said before, most things you hear on the radio, even on ads today, were banned not that long ago. I mean, if, if some of the things Rush Limbaugh said in the language he used today, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you'd say, I can't believe they didn't bleep that out. But now, we're calloused. That's why, that's one of the reasons we have such a good Christian school. Let me just put that out. Because we don't want them to hear those cuss words during the day. From the teachers, the administration, or the other students. Hello? Well, the teachers are good. They don't say, yeah, but the other kids do. And they get callous to it. Parents, we get callous. That's why, are you listening to me? That's why we're immersed over here all day, and we get callous to it. That's why we need to spend as much time as we can here and here so we'll still be sensitive to it when we hear it. Callous sensitivity. Very quickly, we find the collapse of success. The collapse of success. In other words, he lost the blessings of God. He lost the blessings of God. You can go home and study it, but again, incest, lost it all. His wife turned to a pillar of salt, so he lost two of his kids that were destroyed in the city. His wife, who turned, he lost her because she turned to look back, couldn't want to give up the things that she had in Sodom. He lost his kids, if you will, his other two with the immoral relationships. His kids, his grandkids he produced from them became enemies of God, two different nations, enemies of God. What a mess, living in a cave, living in the streets, never heard from again. Just collapsed. And it all happened in a 10-year period. One day. At noon of the day the angels showed up, he had no clue that was his last day in the city. He had no clue that was the last day for his kids. He had no, day, no idea that was the last day for his wife. At even they showed up, that night they had the issue with the men, the next morning, he said, go get your kids out. The angels drug them out, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So by the next night, it's over. But up until that evening, 
Things were great. Had a nice, probably had a very nice house in town. That's why Mrs. Lott says, I'm going to miss it. And look back. Just let me 24 hours later, where he is. Up to then, he thought it was all right. So you sit here and say, Preacher, I'm riding coattails spirituality, but I'm all right. At 11.35. It's all right, preacher. I'm watching the wrong stuff. But I'm all right. It hadn't affected me yet. What's that old expression? Amazing what a day, what a difference a day can make. One day he lost his fame. One day he lost his force and his influence inside that city. He lost all his finances. He lost his family. And he lost his future. Not with Abraham anymore, not to be used of God. Wow. What happened to Brother Lot? Let's make sure. Let's make sure. They, don't, they can't say that about us. And as we close, I think about the coming of our Savior. The coming of our Savior. That's the looking for the coming of God. Luke 17, 22. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. He said, and boy, the days of Lot, they were just in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were just living it up. It was just another day. Oh, the stock market is up. The prices are going down. The gas is fluctuating. We've got, they were just going on. Oh, we've got a wedding coming up over here. We're getting married over here. We're going to build a house over there. We've got the permits in place. Boy, they're just going. Things are just going normal in the wicked city. And Lot was in the gate. So he was a city council member of some sorts, apparently, inside that wicked city. It was just another day. Likewise also in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus is coming back. And He's not going to put it out. i got news for you. It's already leaked. He's coming back. We just don't know when. We just don't know the hour. But it's already leaked. He's coming back. Where is he going to find you? Where is he going to find me? Sitting in the gate of Sodom? He's coming back. You need to be ready. That's why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for your sins and mine. Because see, we're all rotten sinners. Just like Lot was. He said, well, what happened to Brother Lot? He let his old nature take control. He let the old man take control. See, we've all got that same sin nature. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. It's a place called hell. But God commended His love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we believe He died for us and call upon Him, He promises to save. We can be saved. We can go down that whole road. But do you believe it? Have you been saved today? Oh, don't, don't put it off another hour. Jesus would come back. Any second. Any second. The Bible says those that have heard the gospel will believe a lie. Now's the day of salvation. Today's the day. If you're not saved, get saved today. In a moment, we'll have an invitation. We'll invite you to come. If you're not sure you're saved, well, I've been in this church 20 years. Yeah, but are you saved? Are you saved? Are you just riding on those spiritual coattails? Amen and at the right spot. Singing the hymns the right way. I have an invitation to come forward. We'll have somebody show, take the Bible and show you from the Bible how to be saved and let you decide. It won't do anything scary to you. won't pressure you. Just show you. Say, preacher, I am saved. So was Lot. But what a mess. What happened to Brother Lot? Just, you say, there I am, preacher, right there. Step one, step two, step three, step four. I'm glad we can stop and go back. Stop and go back. Let's bow our heads, please.